you know, it's really interesting to be here today, um, and it's also interesting, you know, we were, we watched people close the doors just now. So, you know, the last time we were here, and the last time they closed the doors, you know, the police came in. So, it, it was like, wow, no police here. Right. Like, now it's an achievement. All right, so, um, I'm just going to start with, I'm just going to do a, a, a general check. Do we know what um, LG, LGBTIQ, you know, the, the whole alphabet soup, the, that whole range of alphabets, you know, mushed in together. Do we all know what it stands for? Yeah? Cupid. Yeah? Silence is not consent, <laughs> people. <laughs> So yeah, do we know? Because otherwise, then you're like, <laughs> she is funny. All right, so so you know, LGBTIQ stands for lesbian, uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, trans with an asterisk, so trans men, trans women, and then intersex and queer, and then X Y Z. I don't know. All right. Um, so then we also have P and A. Uh, P stands for pansexual and A is for asexual. But tonight, uh, you know, I, uh, I prefer to, I would use queer trans uh, because I'm just going to lump all the LGBT, uh, all the LB, <laughs> <laughs> right? You know, all the LGB and the Q together and put them under the umbrella of queer. Um, and I identify myself as queer uh, because I think it's really political. Um, that's why I identify myself as queer. And um, and also trans as well. Um, no, I can identify myself as trans, not yet at least. Um, okay, so we're going to start with a bit of background. So in Malaysia, um, we all know that there are laws that criminalize um, same-sex activities, not necessarily um, gay people, um, you know, especially under the civil law. But there are laws that criminalize same-sex activities. For instance, um, under the penal code. Under the civil law, so we have the civil law and the Sharia laws, right? Because we practice this dual system. So under the civil law, we have the Penal Code 377, A, B, and D, uh, which criminalize consensual and non-consensual uh, sex between uh, adults. Well, it prohibits carnal intercourse. So no anal sex and blowjobs for all of you. And uh, no, con it really doesn't matter if you're putting, if you have a condom on or not, you know, <laughs> right? So it really doesn't matter, you know. But pra practice safe sex, people. Um, <laughs> um, and then under the civil law as well, we have Section 21 of the Minor Offences Act, which is used, which is a, um, it's a public nuisance law, you know, it's for, for public loitering and things like that. It's a vagrancy, anti-vagrancy law. And under the law, uh, that law is basically used to arrest and persecute um, trans people for cross-dressing. Okay? And usually, one, uh, usually non-Muslim uh, trans people are arrested, usually trans women, are usually arrested under this law, and usually they are charged 25 ringgit per arrest. Only 25 ringgit, yeah? But they do have a three-strike rule uh, principle that they apply, and so every three times, then, you know, they get sent to prison. And we have documented cases of people who have been sent to prison, who have been um, sentenced to jail, right? Um, I know. What a bullshit, yeah. I love that, You think they've not globalized the donut culture, right? <laughs> so, um, yeah, let's not forget the religious uh, officers, right? So, I know there's... Well, under the Sharia laws, so we not only have to face with the civil law, right? So we also have the Sharia laws. Although it's only for Muslims, but we are also affected by it because, you know, we have Muslim partners and we also live in a Muslim majority context, right? So under the Sharia law, we have um, Liwat. We, we all know Liwat. Um, sexual relations between men. That's criminalized. And then we also have Lelaki Balaga Sabatik Prabhupada. Men impersonating women. So under that law, you know, it says basically, it basically says siapa yang berlagak seperti perempuan di kayala di tempat awam untuk tujuan tidak bermoral boleh disabitkan, you know, denda atau penjara. So basically, anyone who crossdresses in a public space um, for immoral reasons or for immoral purposes can be arrested. Yeah, but you know, in some states they don't have, you know, there are two readings of it. 
in some states it's just sesiapa yang berlaga, uh, berlaga seperti perempuan di tempat awam period so it's just anyone who uh, impersonates um, a woman a man who impersonates a woman in a public space period so you know i mean again you know how do you what is immoral purposes right it's really arbitrary and subjective but you know in some states they actually have that and in some states they don't and so if a, a trans a malay muslim trans woman well it really doesn't matter if you're muslim or not because as long as you look malay and if your identification card says you're muslim you know we are all muslim by ic card so that's all that matters you know then they get picked up fine 100 uh, 1000 ringgit again the general three strike rule three times prison and there there have been people who've been um, who been sentenced to prison because of this law um what is interesting with the sharia law is that under the sharia law there is something that uh, there is a law that criminalizes uh, sexual relation between women and that is called musahaka so um under this law hey how's it going less attention on me right <laughs> so um so <laughs> Um, Musahaka is basically lightly what? So only that you know it criminalizes sexual relations with women. But the thing is, with sexual relations with women, right? People are always like because these are also patriarchs who come up with these laws, right? They always say, how the hell do women actually have sex? You know, so they really don't know what constitutes sex for women. So anything like you know me, like making a move like this. Could be considered as sex, you know, because even foreplay, like whatever that is deemed as foreplay, can be considered as sexual relation between women, right? Because you know it's a mystery, right? That exactly why men are always like, oh my god, that's been sex. <laughs> Am I making way too much? No, I'm not making a generalization. All right, uh, but what is interesting is also that no worries. Oh. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. 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 So, uh, so what is interesting? Mwah ha 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 what? Okay. Um so what is interesting um you know if we really look back at our culture, you know people always say that you know Uh, LGBT, it's not our culture. Ini bukan budaya kita. It's budaya song sang and whatever, right? But if you really look back, and you can look at uh, writings by Michael Pollack, and he has written so much about uh, gender plur- pluralism within the Southeast Asia region and also in Malaysia, and it was documented like up until 80s that there were general tolerance and acceptance towards gender diversity and sexual diversity. People were not too hung up about virginity. People were not too hung up about you know men sleeping with other men, you know it was it was not as you you know as strict as it, it is right it is as it is right now you know, and um, even like you know we've always have you all heard of the uh, term sida sida before? Yeah. yeah, in your in history actually for some of us like we learn it in the uh, in you know Malay history as well. Yeah. So basically sida sida, um, you know is loosely translated as Eunuchs, but in actual fact, like you know, when I looked at all the historical texts, um, Sida Sida are people with male uh, genit- genitals, like they still have functional penis, and um, they still have sex. They are not castrated or whatever, and it was accepted or at least tolerated. So for people to say that this is not a culture is a bit unfounded, right? So it is. It's there are documentation, although very little documentation, that you know, up until 80s, there were general tolerance and acceptance towards uh, sexual diversity and gender diversity. But so what happened in the 80s? So in the 80s, that's right, Islamization, Islamization happened. So I don't want to just say that it's it was Islamization, but it was a political Islamization. What happened was, um, so in the 80s there was all this like Mahathir when uh, was the prime minister and all that, and there was always that there was this tension between Amno and Pas. Sepulagi Melayu, you know, Sepulagi Islam. Who is more Islam? Who is more Malay, right? So and then there was that this whole discussion went into like, okay, now we want to rebrand Amno. 
to be the vanguards of the Malayus. You know? So then they introduce all this bank Islam la, you know, let's, um, what, what else? You know, women have to, there was a lot of regulation, you know, on the way we dress, on the, on the way we, just general, you know, regulation over the bodies of women, right? And also, interestingly, in 83 up to, from 83 to 87, there was a discussion about sexual reassignment surgery. And, you know, in, finally in 87, sex reassignment surgery was prohibited. They, really, uh, they issued a fatwa and there was a prohibition, they, they banned sex reassignment surgery for trans women. Prior to that, right, sex reassignment surgery was conducted by four doctors in university hospital. One of them, uh, Professor Khairuddin, very outspoken about it, is Malay Muslim. And he has no problems with like, you know, um, you know, allowing people to be, you know, be comfortable in whatever body that they choose, right? So there was a general, you know, there was a shift in the way people um, view and the way people accepted um, sexual diversity and gender diversity after post-Islamization in the 80s. And another thing is the civil law, the Penal Code 377, is not actually from here. You know, we, are, we were colonized by the Brits, right? God save the Queen. Um, so, um, when in the in 1860s, there was the Indian Mutiny, and then the Penal Code 377 was introduced in India. And then later it was brought to Hong Kong and then all the British colonies. So till today, like a lot of African countries, a lot of countries in Asia, we still have Penal Code 377. When in the UK, you can marry your partner, you can have civil union, you, you know, and you can, it's, it's really ironic, isn't it? Like now, in, it, this, is, this is not even our law, you know, and yet, and it, they've progressed so much and we are here still talking about, damn it, man, like they're criminalizing same sexual activities, right? So this is like really mind-boggling. And for people to say that, you know, this is our culture, being intolerant to sexual diversity and gender diversity is our culture, is bullshit. Because there are documentations of, you know, acceptance and tolerance towards um, people like us, right? Okay, so moving on. So then, um, so is that clear so far? Yeah? Good. <laughs> you know, in Occupy, because people didn't like to talk, right? so we would do this. Yeah, I see you. How's it going? All right, uh, I'm very lame this way. Sorry. Like, <laughs> um, so, yeah, um, so fast forward to 98. I think that, you know, so the Islamization process happened, and then, you know, in 98, obviously, Anwar became the you know, the poster child of sodomy of Malaysia, right? <laughs> yeah, he was the poster child. I, I mean, it with like, total respect, man. Like, <laughs> total respect. <laughs> okay. So, so, um, so, so, in 98, there was this whole wave of like, Oh my God, look at this guy. He's like, you know, having sex with another guy. What are you going to do about it? You know, so, but also at the same time, there was all this like internal conflict within Amno, right? Um, so, you know, obviously it was politicized and it was used as a scapegoat. And obviously they charged him with two things, sodomy and corruption, but no one cared about the corruption. Anyway, because they were too preoccupied looking at the mattress that was being bring, bring packed. Right? So, yeah, so there was a whole... Tilang Lama. Warning. So, um, so, I think the whole Tilang incident, the whole mattress incident, clearly, you know, and obviously, and you know, clearly, you know, uh, sort of shifted the way people viewed, again, viewed uh, LGBTIQ people as well. Um, because there was a whole general atmosphere of like, ew, what are we gonna do about this? Can we have a person who is gay, uh, representing and not, and whatever. Um, but at the same time, you know, 
first law came up, the People's Voluntary Action Against Homosexuals, and People's Action whatever against homosexuals now. That's all that matters, you know? <laughs> they were against homosexuals, right? <laughs> and they can't come up with better names. If you, really, this is my conspiracy theory, I'm going to tell you. Did you see my eyes? Like, <laughs> like Ibrahim Ali always comes up with like, stuff that starts with P. Pasra, Pukida. And then yeah. Pukasa. Pukasa. Oh, and then there's also Pukida. I'm sure that's part of you know his thing as well. So it's always starts with the P. I don't know why. What's this fascination with P? <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, what is this fascination? Let's get to the bottom of this. So, um, so yeah. So they they established Pasra. So Pasra then when in, they they were like, okay, we're gonna do this road show. We're gonna like tell people that you know homosexuality is wrong and things like that and that again created an atmosphere of fear and then they, you know every day in and day out you know if you look at the newspapers back in 98 and uh, 97 98 99 there were loads of raids in gay clubs so again pushed the community underground right and then we fast forward to um Manani. And then again, you know, in 2008, um, there was another, uh, well, there was another case as well. But what the impact of this Anwar Ibrahim's case is that, you know, it really sort of shaped the way we looked at and the way we analyzed um, issues pertaining to uh, gay and, the, you know, LGBTIQ rights. Because we always looked at it as, you know, the state is politicizing this issue. The state is politicizing this issue. The state is politicizing this issue. When, in fact, the state is quite homophobic, you know? And um, I think, you know, it sort of diluted the, the, the rights and the actual struggle of the community, you know, with this Anwar Ibrahim case. So I think that's one thing as well. Like, even now when we talk about all these efforts that, uh, that's happening, it's also interesting, the timing as well, right? It's always before elections. And when, obviously when it's before election, then you go like, oh damn it, you know, they're again politicizing it. But if you also l look at the, if you plot all the incidents, right? Yeah, it is an ethnic cleansing sort of trend, you know? They're going into schools, like right now, I don't have to tell you all the things that's happening right now, you know? Um, what's, what's their name? JMM is going into schools to like do anti, uh, you know, LGBT, activities in school, and then they're pumping in money uh, to um, train the counselors to, so that they're equipped to conduct counselings with people, and then, you know, they're doing this stupid play, Asmara Songsa, and all sorts of things, right? So if you really look at it, yeah, they are applying this concept of let's nip everything in the butt now, you know? Let's start with the young kids. And also, it's very smart of the state to do this as well because, um, you know, members of civil society like us, we have no access to schools, you know, and a lot of times kids, you know, they don't attack adults, you know. It's always kids who are, you know, being attacked, who are being targeted. And, and let me tell you as well, it's not, it's actually not even sexual orientation or gender identity. People are purely being targeted on gender expression based on whether you're effeminate or not bit on your clothing, based on your just mannerism. And I think that's a problem because, you know, yeah, yeah, out of like maybe 10 kids and you get like 8 kids, right? The other 2 kids are going to be so messed up and they're going to become homophobes or transphobes in the end. You know, so there are, you know, all these different activities clearly, you know, with, especially with young kids, is really problematic because one, you know, they are not as empowered as adults to say like, look, stop this, I don't want to be part of this, and whatever. And everything in this country needs parental consent. So that becomes a problem as well. Um, okay, so enough about that. I'm just going to go into like organizing as well. Well, wow. okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I'm just going to go into organizing as well. Um, in... Um, in Malaysia, um, of course, you know, the LGBT, IQ groups, the queer trans groups have organized since the 80s. So we see like, you know, um, the Matnyas, um, the trans women community, in the 80s, they had the Persatuan Matnya 
Vilaya Pushtapad, which actually was the, the association of the trans, the association of Matnya of Vilaya Pushtapad. So that was established in the 80s. And in the 80s, they were funded by Ministry of Welfare. So they were actually given money to like go out and do Gotong Royo and uh, play, you know, organize, you know, activities like Sukaneka, like oh, volleyball and things like that. And they all had uniforms and kabayas and bajikurongs and things like that. But later then, you know, um, it was because of the complaints and there were harsh clampdowns by uh, the religious department as well. I think there were a lot of uh, discussions around that. Should we even allow this such organization to exist? Because then they would recruit more trans people, right? Again, the general, you know, the, 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 the. Okay, so. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, and then that happened and they were shut down. <coughs> also, another interesting thing was that none of them, although they were given this money, this, this um, X amount, like about few thousand, right? They were not given skills. So in the end, they were blamed for, you know, like, oh, you didn't know how to manage your accounts. But like, you know, you take women out of the streets and then you tell them, okay, I'm going to give you some money. And they just expect them to like run whatever without providing them adequate skills. Again, that's the same thing that's happening right now. Like even when, and, and the, you know, this is again another way for the government, because they like to pick on people who are economically marginalized as well. You know, um, with the Mukhayam camp that's going on, the transgender camp, the correction camps that, they, that they've been organizing. So Sulastri is this really great trans activist and, and she told me the way that they packaged it and they proposed to her, they, they said it was like a uh, capacity building, skills building session to actually impart entrepreneurial skills to trans women so that they can get out of the street and do whatever that they want. But then she looked at the program and she went like, okay, it's a three-day camp. Uh, only two hours is dedicated to you know, business and entrepreneurial skills sort of session. And the rest were just for let's go pray, let's do some sharing sessions, and let's like talk about religion, how we love religion. And at the end of the camp, they were all given kain polika, the sarongs, and the skull cap, the kopia. So what kind of message are they trying to give out to people? You know? So, and, and these are the kind of things that they do. They're very sneaky about it. They tell people that, you know, we are going to organize a business and capacity building so that we can do this and that. But then in the end, they just actually want to convert people. And they pick on the economically marginalized people because they know it's easy. So even within the, LG, you know, the queer, trans, LGBTIQ movement, there's also the different intersectionality and the, you know, the class, the race, the religion and all that. And when you mix it all up, and it becomes really, really complicated as well. And I think this is one thing that we also don't look at, um, you know, even within the queer community, being part of the queer community, like we don't really look at the intersectionality of things, you know. We, we always assume that we are just queer and nothing else, you know. But, you know, especially outside of this KL scene, you know. So that's another issue that we need to explore because people who are economically marginalized, face a lot more, uh, a lot more vulnerable and uh, uh, that can be targeted by the state. Okay, so in terms of organizing, uh, I'm just going to move on from that. Everyone is looking also sad and blue. Hi, guys. Oh, don't worry. Everything will be all right. <laughs> okay. Um, so, yeah. Um, um, what was that? Um, did I brush my feet today? I did. <laughs> because I, I looked at Elaine and she was like, there's something in my... I was like, oh shit, I'm getting self-conscious. Okay, so in terms of organizing, there's a difference in organizing, right? There's also political organizing and there's also the non-political organizing. Like, you know, you organize stuff with your friends and you do sporting activities and you go shopping and do whatever. That's like the non-political organizing, right? Uh, and then there's a the political organizing like Sexuality Mudeka, Justice for Sisters, and all these people who are crazy and want to be arrested. You know? <laughs> like, Thank you. Um, Sexuality Mudeka also came up at a very interesting time. 
where there was a lot of uh, organizing by, you know, members of civil society were really, really angry, like, you know, people were just like, no, we've had enough of this, and we want some kind of change. So, Sexual Mandrika also grew in that environment, it, it came up in that environment, and it's also, I'm, I am from Sexual Mandrika, but I can also be critical of it, but it was also a reactionary group. Right? We were not, and a lot of the groups that we have right now, the political, we are reactionary. Because, so then we don't actually recognize the needs sometimes. So sometimes we become reactionary and therefore then we lose support from the community as well. Right? See, some of, some people are nodding. So that's good. Okay? <laughs> um, so, that's true. I know. I'm genius. Right? Um, so, so, in terms of that, we are still very, very new. So probably Sexual Modeka was like five years, uh, started five years ago. So maybe uh, plus or minus that, maybe ten years. But at the, in the, but since the 80s as well, there have been individual organi uh, I mean individuals who have been working on the sexuality rights movement on individual capacity with their organizations as well. So the movement in itself is not sustainable in Malaysia because of different uh, different factors. The fact that, you know, um, for the longest time there was an issue, there, w there was issue of representation. And I think issue of representation is something that, um, you know, that's quite common here. You know, people always want, okay, if you want to talk about sexuality rights, then, you know, you need to come out as someone from the community to talk about it. And I think for the longest time, we were trapped in this sort of mindset, you know, in this sort of framework. Uh, but then I think things changed with, uh, you know, as, as, as uh, different human rights organizations started seeing more queer people in like different spaces. And we were like, you know, I mean the NGO scene is so small, right? And there were queer people working in there. And you know, when people are familiar with, and people see you every day, people feel like, oh yeah, that is an issue. So visibility is actually a very important thing as working um, especially in this environment, or any environment for that matter. Because every time that we are not present, our issues can be forgotten as well. But you know, yeah, but things are also slowly changing, but it's really important that uh, we, we have visibility. And see, then this becomes, uh, then we go into like a catch-22 sort of argument, right? Because the environment is pretty hostile, and so that doesn't allow people to come out so how do you want to have, how can we have representation if the environment in itself is hostile? And then who speaks on behalf of whom, you know? That becomes an issue as well in terms of representation. So it's a very complex situation, especially when we speak on behalf of other people. And how do we, um, how do we present ourselves? Do we come up, uh, do we say we are allies? Or do we say that, you know, we are speaking on, uh, you know, do we pretend like we know the issues of uh, queer and trans people? Does that make sense at all? Yeah? Yeah? <laughs> all right, okay. Um, because um, when I was in Thailand a few, I mean, I was uh, somewhere a few months ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, I, and I always like to sort of talk to people and um, and uh, talk to them about the history of um, lesbians and uh, queer women. And even in the 70s, there were all Malaysian women were already part of lesbian and queer women network within the region. But you know, but it's just that you know, uh, you hear a lot of stories, but it it's not sustain. It has never been sustainable. We've never managed to sustain the movement. That's my point. With that, okay. So I'm just going to go back to the timing of SM and how it how it grew in this era where you know everything was just so heated and everyone was just so rah rah about things and everyone wanted to just like take down the government, right? So there was already a lot of dissent and uh, resistance and all that thing. And whether or not we made the right decision with Ambiga, we were all, we were already going to get banned anyway because we were already being monitored. We were already monitored. Because, um, you know, Jakim sent letters out to our supporters and allies and asked them like, to acknowledge and to tell them if they've in fact supported SM before. So we were already on the radar. But, you know, having Ambika that just gave it a little 
a little extra push and nudge, you know. So then you became like, ooh. But, <laughs> but one positive thing is that, you know, back then they used to call us all pondan, bapo, you know, whatever. But now, you know, change, they call us, they use LGBT. You know, so that's that's a positive thing, you know. Out of, out of that whole thing. Um, so, but you know, it's also interesting how we want to look at the banning, right? Do we want to just say that, you know, the banning um, of sexuality Merdeka was a political, um, was a political move? Or was it to suppress all sorts of political movement that was uh, coming up at that point? Or was it because they're really homophobic and transphobic? Because since the banning of SM, things have gone down the hill for like queer trans people. So it's also, I, I really want to also encourage people to like have a more postmodernist point of view, you know, so that to, to, in, to look at other factors as well. Because if we really just like rely on this election sort of point of view and we are all, this issue is just being politicized, I think we will sort of like um, forget and sideline the the real issue, which is like the real violation towards uh, LGBTIQ people and how they're doing it with young people, which is even more problematic. Um, okay. So I'm just going to like um, go into what, because I really don't want to talk a lot about the Malaysian situation as well, because I also want to make the connection with the global movement. So right now, um, at the global level, you know, wh what do we hear about? Like, you know, what are the issues that you hear about when you listen or read news about LGBTIQ people around the world? Same-sex marriage, equality. Same-sex marriage? Yeah. Right? Same-sex marriage is like so hot right now. It's so hot that it's so untouchable. <laughs> I'm like, whoo! Um, no, because the thing is, I've been in conferences and places and in meetings, and people from the EU would be like, so what do you think of like same-sex, what if we push for same-sex marriage around, around the globe? And that is extremely scary for someone who's from the global south. To me, that is like, are you serious? So like, you know, because at this point right now, we don't even have any form of recognition. No one wants to protect us. If I get killed tomorrow, it would be just like, oh, she died. <laughs> That's it. It would not even be hate crime or you know some sort of crime. It's because she's a deviant, you know. That's what it's going to be. Because you know, so for us to even talk about same-sex marriage is a bit ridiculous at this point. Not that I'm saying there's a hierarchy of things that we need to, you know, we need to do things in order. But you know, we need to be mindful of the global um, south and not politics as well. Um, yeah, right now it's same-sex marriage, and then after that, Hillary Clinton made that wonderful speech about like how gay rights are human rights, and she, you know, it's great that I'm, I'm not, I mean, like great, you know, prop A, way to go, man, you know, um, and it's great that you know there's so many, you know, a lot of advancements in the state and in the global north, but for people to assume that the same model and template would apply for the global south is a bit, uh, it's a bit premature and it's a bit presumptuous. Um, I think because even within the, the global south region, here is where we have a lot more of uh, criminalization and um, because in the African region, in uh, a lot of countries in Asia, we, have, we still have laws that criminalize um, LGBTIQ people. Yeah, no, I'm just like looking at the guy who's outside. <laughs> so, um, and we also see the domino effect of the same-sex marriage right now. Like, um, it's happening in France, um, where people are rallying against, um, you know, so there's the discourse and they want to legalize same-sex marriage, but then the people are not even using religious arguments anymore. They are basically talking about how it's going to destroy heteronormative family institutions, family unit. And it's, it's basically a people's own insecurities. And then, um, it, because it, 
we are not talk, we are not even challenging anything we just we are just saying that we want to be part of your you know we just want to have the same right as you to adopt kids to be to have to find love and things like that but you know it's other it's the others who actually feel that you know we are going to destroy the family unit which really doesn't make sense because it, all these um, problems and arguments stem from people's their own insecurities about their own family unit right um, and it's interesting as well because right now uh, we are also seeing the same sex uh, discourse same sex marriage discourse in vietnam and in thailand so in thailand they're pushing for same sex legalization of uh, same sex marriage and <coughs> well they're going to call it it's same sex marriage but it's actually civil union um, and in Malaysia, a few days after that, um, Elaine actually sent me, sent everyone this article. Elaine sitting over there. Um, she's a very good organizer. Um, sent me this, um, sent everyone this email, and um, this article from Utusan Malaysia said that, uh, which said, what did it say? Um, the Budaya Songsang Gugat Keluarga or something, something like that, you know? how you know, um, all this deviant culture would threaten family institutions. Um, and the whole article was, abso it was absolutely you know, unfounded, moral panic. You know, they were going on and they said, you know, and, and I also want to say this, we've never talked about same-sex marriage at all. We've never, none of us have ever talked about same-sex marriage. And the fact that people are talking about this really shows that they are really panicking. Because they're really worried. All that we've asked for is that even in our statements, in whatever meetings that I've been to, is just protection. Protection for LGBTIQ people and promotion of our rights. We've never talked about same-sex marriage. And all this while we've all only been talking about, you know, we've not even talked about, let's uh, repeal 377. We've only talked about the Sharia law, which is the Lalaki Balaga Sabati Pramukwan. So the fact that people are talking about this, it shows that they are really panicking and they're worried that you know this is going to happen here and this is also going to threaten the work that we do. Not that I say that you know, you know, people from the global north shouldn't talk about things, but you know, when people become very, uh, when people speak on behalf, this is again the issue of representation, when people speak on behalf of other people, and say that you know, oh, this is what's needed in other all over the world. Then that becomes a problem. Then that sort of shapes the global sexuality uh, rights movement and discourse and the discussion. So um, yeah, so that's one. And and also with this whole globalization of the sexuality rights movement and how people are talking about same-sex marriage, adoption, and whatever things that we've not even talked about here. There is a tension between the West and the Arab world and the Islam bloc. So now there are two blocks. Like for instance, like in the UN, um, two years ago, I think, they passed, uh, they put out this resolution, uh, they presented this uh, report on the protection of LGBT, IQP, LGBT people um, around the world. And now uh, a lot of countries, the OIC bloc, including Malaysia, about 56 to 57 countries, walked out because they didn't even want to listen. They completely walked out because they were like, we don't agree with this. So it really shows there is a tension between the West and the Islamic <coughs> bloc and the OIC and the Arab blocs and all that. Um, and then we also see people organizing within the re in, with, um, in, re in this respective region. For instance, at the ASEAN level, you know, um, at the ASEAN level as well, you see, like I think last year, um, we are all part of ASEAN, right? <coughs> the Southeast Asia region is in ASEAN. Well, not all of them, but eight or ten. No, we have more. Okay, anyway. <laughs> um, so, basically, um, last year they came up with the ASEAN Human Rights Declaration, and we were all lobbying for the inclusion of sexual orientation and gender identity in the declaration. But Malaysia and Brunei, and to some extent Singapore, said that no, we cannot have sexual orientation and gender identity in the Human Rights Declaration. So it was removed. So you also see like, you know, and, and what is interesting as well, if you look at, you know, uh, if you look at it in isolation, right, like Thailand, Vietnam, and uh, what's the name? Philippines. Philippines all have progressive laws and are 
pretty much fog LGBT rights in their countries. So it's really difficult as well when people go in a block because there's also trade that is at cost. There's also peace. Not that you know ASEAN is going to do anything about any sort of conflict because everything gets swept under the carpet and they're all like non-alliance policy and whatever. <laughs> and like I mean non-interference policy, sorry. Uh, but you know it really shows that sometimes people do put away their own. Uh, they because it, we are sometimes we are seen as liabilities, right? Sometimes you know the queer trans issues can be pushed aside for better things like trade, economy, you know, peace, security, and all that nonsense. Um, even in like recently, the I was um, we attended the Commission of Women Status meeting. And again, um, the Arab League, the Arab nations, and the OIC, including Malaysia as well, completely opposed to the, to even you know, to, to talk about the rights of lesbian, bisexuals, and trans people, because then for them, talking about it and protecting and promoting the rights, our rights, is seen as something that is so ridiculous because it is not part of the culture. And now we're going backwards, and again with this whole block of like, you know, the East and the West, the Islam and the West, you know, you see the whole discussion of like traditional values. We're going back, because recently there was a meeting in Nepal where we're, there's going to be a follow up resolution to the UN resolution that was passed in 2000, two years ago on protection and promotion of the rights of LGBT people. And so there's going to be another resolution next year. Uh, sponsored by South Africa, um, and you know, so there was a meeting for uh, for countries to meet and dis talk about this issue before they go to the UN level. Um, and again, you know, people from the East and and from Asia were all more concerned about traditional values. How do we reconcile this LGBTIQ people with our traditional values? Yeah? So that, be, that is a problem because there's no way that you can talk to someone who want to reject human rights because um, it is seen as something from the West. But when we really look back at the history, there was a lot of respect and tolerance for gender diversity and sexual diversity within this region. So it's really mind-boggling as well when you really look at it. Um, yeah, so I think... Do I have more time, or how long do I have? Five ten more minutes. Okay, so, but I also want to just go on a bit about um, um, about the human rights framework and how sometimes it fails the LGBT community as well. Because I work, <laughs> I'm, I'm like completely disillusioned with everything, but I still work within the human rights framework, and I do have the privilege to attend all these like different meetings because you know sexuality rights is such a niche area in this country. So <laughs> not more privilege for me, right? So, um, but the, but that's the truth, right? Uh, because there are not so many other people. Um, so, and I recognize that privilege as well. Um, <coughs> if you look at it from the human rights perspective, you know we always look at it as like LGBT, and sometimes we forget the gender diversity and the sexual diversity within the community. You know, for instance, for us to like even acknowledge the queer community was really difficult. So, like, and when I was, and you know, at, in Malaysia, the discourse of uh, gender diversity and sexual diversity is still, um, it's still pretty new. Like, you know, for instance, in Europe now, people do identify themselves as intergender or cross-gender. So, you know, someone who identifies themselves as trans, but still would look like, you know, they don't want to have any form of um, body modification, but still identify themselves as trans or something else. Uh, so they then identify themselves as intergender. Even to like include, pan, you know, to even talk about pansexuality is very difficult, you know. And also when we come from this um, human rights perspective as well, a lot of times, invisibilization happens. For instance, with the human rights framework, sometimes we forget about social construct, and we always use the very essentialist theory. For instance, with essentialism, we always say that we, we follow the um, 
Lady Gaga song, we are all born this way. Amen. You know, and um, well, the social constructivists, on the other hand, feel that, you know, no, you know, sometimes you can be socially constructed to, you can learn to like, you can learn behavior and then you may find attraction, you may not necessarily, you don't have to be born gay, lesbian, trans, whatever, you know. So, in when we talk about, when we all only focus on the essentialist theory, then a lot of the invisibilization happens, especially with the bisexual community. It's very difficult to talk about the rights of bisexuals because you feel like, okay, I understand about lesbians and gays and trans because they're all born that way. But what about bisexuals? Are they just not greedy? <laughs> Why do they have to lie? Just, just pick one. Just pick one. What's wrong with the people? And, and so, and yeah, sluts. And, and it's, can you imagine if it's, diff, you know, it's, re, it's difficult to talk about bisexuality, then what about being queer? Queer is just like, it's just like this, we don't want to open that can of worms, you know, like, <laughs> you're just like, uh, because queer, the idea, the notion of being queer is that you transcend everything and you don't really want to box yourself in this sort of binary framework, whether, you know, I don't want to just date men and women, or women, and men or women, I want to date everyone. It really doesn't matter, right? It's fluid. Gender um, identity and sexuality is fluid. So how do you actually use a human rights framework to talk about this? And especially if you come from an essentialist point of view, right? So, and also, you know, it's also very difficult then when you talk about pansexuality and asexuality, you know, but where people who are asexual feel like, I have no sexual desire. How do you talk about sexual violence with some, you know, when someone is asexual? So one of the biggest, bigger problems is also when we always come from a human rights framework, it sort of invisibilizes some of the issues and it also doesn't recognize the gender diversity within the community. And yeah, so then that becomes an issue as well. So I think I've already given you like too much like to think about. like. Yeah, I feel I'm overloading people with a lot of stuff. Um, so I think I'll just stop here. Like, is that okay with anyone? Okay. <laughs>